Kentu grew up as an eager-to-please kid. His mother married a man 24 years her senior when she was only 13 years old. Ruben Cantu was the fourth of five children born to Arella and Finicio Cantu. Arella raised her boys and a daughter mostly alone while her husband worked long hours as a maintenance worker. By the time Cantu turned 14 years old, his mother left her husband and moved 30 miles away to a mostly Mexican-American town of about 5,000 people to be closer to her parents. Arella asked Cantu to come along, but he chose to stay with his father in their tiny trailer park on Bridge Street, a place where drug dealers, smugglers, and thieves lived and worked in houses marked with bullet San Antonio, holes. Antonio, the most dangerous city in America, homicides last year. An investigation into the safety of San Antonio, to San Antonio, San Antonio really is overnight. that dangerous. While his father worked, often very long hours into the night, Kentu was skipping school and learning different lessons while hanging out on the streets. Neighborhood offers his new Kentu since they had previously arrested his older brother on drug and theft charges. They disliked Kentu as well, but they had never successfully pinned crime on him. And he learned quickly to avoid the San Antonio police, a police force that in some of his darkest days in the 1980s was plagued by scandals related to drug dealing officers and vigilantes who took justice into their own hands. It was against this backdrop of mutual suspicion that Cantu soon emerged as a leading suspect after a violent murder and robbery that occurred on Bridge Street on November 8, 1984. Pedro Gomez, who at the time was 25 years old, along with his friend Juan Marino, 19 years old, had eaten dinner and gone to sleep inside of a home that they had been working construction on. The homeowners had asked the men to spend the night in the house to protect it against burglars who had recently stolen a water heater from the property. Both men were paid for their work in cash. That night, they slept in their clothes with wallets containing a total of about $1,000. They were woken up to the lights being switched on and confronted by two Latino teenagers with their rifle demanding their money. Gomez a father of three girls back in Mexico, handed over his wallet with about $600 inside. He then turned over the mattress and reached toward a revolver hidden in rags. The intruders opened fire, shooting nine times at Gomez. He was shot in the head and died on the scene. The weapon was then turned to 19-year-old Moreno, and the burglars fired again. When Moreno blacked out, the pair fled. Near death, Moreno managed to stumble outside for help. At 11.58 p.m., a police officer found Moreno bleeding on the seat of a pickup truck in front of the house. His wallet and his money were untouched. According to Moreno, and consistent with police reports, he was visited by the police in the hospital the day after the shooting. However, he could barely speak. The description he gave of his attackers fit almost all the male teens in the neighborhood two Mexican-Americans who he thought lived nearby. Moreno survived, and he would later lose a lung, kidney, and part of his stomach due to his injuries. Five days later, in a second interview, Moreno was shown a number of photos. Ruben Cantu's photo was not included, and Moreno didn't identify any of the people shown in the photo as one of the two teens. Then, a rumor was passed along the halls of San Antonio High School, where Cantu was in the ninth grade. A shop teacher reported that three kids had been involved in the robbery and murder of Pedro Gomez, and that students were saying Cantu had done the killing. Based on that information, the officer returned to Moreno on December 16, 1984, this time showing Moreno photographs of five Hispanic men. This time, one of the photos included Cantu. Moreno did not identify Kentu or anyone else in the photo shown to him that day. Police never found the murder weapon and didn't gather any physical evidence from the scene. Pedro Gomez's murder had gone unsolved for four months with few leads. That's until Ruben Kentu had a run-in with an off-duty police officer at a nearby pool hall, Officer Joe de la Luz. According to Kentu, a dispute arose over a game of pool Officer De La Luz threatened him, revealing his concealed weapon and not identifying himself as a police officer. 
This provoked Kintu to fire at the officer, shooting him four times. Officer Jo de la Luz testified, however, that Kentu had been completely unprovoked when he was shot. Though Kentu never denied shooting Officer de la Luz, the case against him had been dropped as defense attorneys claimed the police illegally searched Kentu's home the night of the shooting. There was an overreaction and some of the evidence may have been tainted. It cannot be prosecuted, said former homicide sergeant Bill Yule, who oversaw the investigation. Kentu was never prosecuted for that crime. But Sergeant Yule was a friend of Officer De La Luz and said the attack prompted him to reopen the unsolved Bree Street murder of Pedro Gomez. Since there wasn't enough evidence to indict Cantu in the bar shooting, it's said that officials instead began looking at him as a possible suspect in the Gomez murder. Sergeant Yule consulted with Officer De La Luz and then sent out a different bilingual detective to show Cantu's photo to Moreno again. This time, the detective, Edward Quintanilla, brought Moreno back to the police station and again showed him Cantu's photo along with four other mugshots. The officer's report indicates that this time Moreno did pick Cantu. The prosecution's case at the trial that convicted Ruben Cantu is summarized as follows. On the night of November 8, 1984, at approximately 11.30 p.m., Ruben Cantu, age 17 at the time, and his friend David Garza, 15, broke into a vacant San Antonio house under construction at 605 Brick Street and robbed two Hispanic males at gunpoint. The two victims, Pedro Gomez, 25, and Juan Marino, 19, had been workmen sleeping on the floor mattresses at a construction site guarding against burglary, as a water heater had recently been stolen from the work site. The two victims were sleeping in their work clothes with their pockets full of their cash earnings at the time of their robbery. Cantu and Garza were carrying a rifle, which they used to rob the two men of their wristwatches. As they tried to take their cash, they were interrupted by Gomez's attempt to retrieve a pistol hidden under their mattress. Gomez was shot at least nine times by the boy's rifle, dying instantly and Moreno was also shot as many as nine times by the same rifle. Thinking they had killed both men, the two teens then fled the scene. John Moreno survived the attack and was able to leave the house and call for help shortly after the event, though he lost one lung, one kidney, and part of his stomach. The key trial witness was Juan Moreno, the shooting survivor, who allegedly identified Kentu twice as Gomez's murderer once from a photo lineup and a second time during in-court testimony. However, Moreno's eyewitness account was flawed. He had initially identified the suspects who shot him and Pedro Gomez as two Mexican teenagers. It wasn't until the third time that police visited Moreno and after they said the name Ruben Cantu, that Moreno identified Cantu in a photo lineup. The jury convicted Cantu of capital murder after deliberating for just an hour and a half. Four days after his conviction, Cantu wrote an impassioned letter to the residents of San Antonio saying he was framed for Gomez's murder. Defense attorneys who appealed Cantu's case multiple times attacked police for coercing the only witness to the crime. The appeals were unsuccessful and on August 24, 1993, at 22 minutes after midnight, at age 26, Cantu died by lethal injection, becoming the fifth juvenile offender to be executed by Texas. During the years following the conviction, the surviving victim, the co-defendant, the district attorney, and the jury forewoman have made public statements that cast doubt on Cantu's guilty verdict. Moreno, who was an undocumented immigrant, later recanted his testimony against Cantu, saying he felt pressure from the police to finger Cantu. He says he knew at the time that the police were determined to charge Cantu with a robbery homicide and that Cantu had been involved in a shooting of a police officer. Moreno said that the person who shot him had very curly hair and that he was never shown a photo of the real shooter. But Juan Moreno said his damning in court identification was based on his fear of authorities and police interest in Cantu. David Garza, who was 15 at the time and Cantu's co-defendant, has since admitted involvement in the burglary. He says he did go inside the house with another boy, 
did participate in the robbery and saw the murder take place, but that his accomplice was not Ruben Kandu. According to Garza, the real murderer was an elementary school friend of Kandu. This person, whose only criminal record is a single misdemeanor domestic assault conviction, denied that he had anything to do with the robbery and murder. Garza has signed a sworn affidavit saying he allowed his friend to be falsely accused. The Chronicle found other problems with Kentu's case as well. Police reports have unexplained omissions and irregularities. Witnesses who could have provided an alibi for Kentu that night were never interviewed, and no physical evidence, not even a fingerprint or a bullet, tied Kentu to the crime. Lisa Olson's investigation with the Houston Chronicle garnered a great deal of attention and even led to a post-mortem investigation in 2007 by then District Attorney Susan Reed. However, Reed found Cantu's conviction and execution to be justified. Critics have noted that Reed was formerly a judge who handled Cantu's appeal and set his execution date, which raised a conflict of interest. Presented with Lisa's investigation, as well as information from hundreds of pages of court and police documents, key players in Cantu's death, including the judge, prosecutor, head juror, and defense attorney, now acknowledge that his conviction seems to have been built on omissions and lies. When I was DA and we were doing the Cantu case, I was, I was young enough at that point to, uh, to not understand that eyewitness testimony is not always reliable. I believed at that point in my life, naively, that, uh, that eyewitnesses can be relied on. And so the decision that I made in 1984-1985, uh, whenever it was that I made that decision, was to prosecute a, a um, very young person, even though he was notorious um, and well-known to the police um, because of other incidents. I made the decision to prosecute him as a capital murder defendant on the basis of the testimony of a single eyewitness. And that shocked me when I saw it because I couldn't believe that even at the age of 35, whatever I was, that that I would have made that decision. Um, I acknowledged that I had made a mistake, um, and um, which I didn't realize at the time. Although I've never acknowledged that that he was innocent, um, because I'm bothered by the possibility that he was, and because I'm responsible for all of the decisions that were made in his case. During eight years on death row, Cantu repeatedly insisted he was innocent of murder. In 1987, he wrote to the Board of Pardons and Paroles saying, I was tried and convicted on bogus evidence. Cantu was the 66th person executed in Texas since the state resumed capital punishment in 1982. He was also the youngest prisoner on Texas death row when he was convicted at the age of 18. Since her son's death, Arella has made two trips back to the prison where her son was executed to visit other inmates. She said that she still keeps in touch with two inmates and feels that it helps her deal with Kentu's death. After hearing this story, I'm interested to hear what you think. Next week, we'll tell the story of Larry Griffin, a 19-year-old from Missouri. Larry was represented by a recent law school graduate with no prior murder case experience. There were three eyewitnesses who substantiated Larry's claim of innocence. The state's primary witness may have been bribed to point the finger at Larry, and there was no forensic evidence linking him to the murder. However, in 1981, Larry was convicted and sentenced to death. <laughs>